Hi, welcome back. Sarah here. Today I wanted to go through the Kung Fu Panda Tarot spread. The spread was created by Kimberly Tan, the creator of the Way of the Panda Tarot. And if you've never seen the Way of the Panda Tarot, well, you are missing out. It is such a treat. And I've seen Lisa Pepez and Kim herself both do the spread on video. And I also wanted to give it a try on my own as well. I am using the mini version today because that is the first deck that I ever got and so I'm quite bonded with it. I just did the spread for myself off camera and took some notes on it. The spread is included in the Way of the Panda companion book, so it's not included in the Way of the Panda like guidebook that comes with the deck. It's included in the side or extra book that you can purchase separately from the deck. Kim did briefly show the spread on camera on her video, so you can go to her video to see the spread if you don't have the book for yourself. I also have some tips on how to read or navigate through big spreads in case they kind of overwhelm you like they kind of overwhelm me. So let us go through the spread and my tips for how to read and use big tarot spreads. These tips for reading big spreads could also be used for reading spreads with any number of cards. They don't have to just be for big spreads, but sometimes it might be easy to get overwhelmed with big spreads. So I hope that these tips will be more useful for navigating bigger spreads in particular. So here is a walkthrough of the Kung Fu Panda spread. So. Before we get into the reading, the first thing I like to do is to take a moment to sit and mentally prepare for the spread. It's important that you understand what the purpose is. Is there a specific topic on your mind for the specific reading? For example, if you have your relationship or your career or any specific question on your mind, or if this is a general reading, then just take a moment to think about what's been going on in your life or what's coming up. Basically taking a moment to ground yourself and mentally prepare for the spread is important. So first, looking at the purpose of the spread and kind of grounding myself and mentally preparing myself to read this spread. As the description of the spread says in the book, this spread is for when you need to do some serious butt kicking and channel some epic heroism. And in my journal, when I was writing down notes for the spread, that is exactly what I wrote here. This is for serious butt kicking, unlocking epic heroism. I also wrote down the purpose or my mind space going into the spread. I'm feeling like I'm rising out of a funk and I want to keep building my own self-confidence and shamelessness. So that's my suggestion. That's my first tip. Just take a moment to write down your mental space, what you're hoping to get out of this spread, and of course, the actual purpose of the spread. I am a big fan of note-taking because when I visualize things and write them out on paper, it's easier for me to see the connections between things than if I were to try to just keep them all in my head. I don't write down every single tarot reading, but I do suggest that for big spreads, especially if it's your first or second time doing them, it's nice to just write things out and you know just get them out on paper so you can help make connections on paper. So that is what I wrote for the purpose of the spread. Serious butt kicking, unlocking epic heroism. I want to kick some butt. How can I do that? Okay. So now going into the spread itself, the next tip I have is to look at the shape of a spread. Does it tell a story? Kim is a master at creating very creative spreads. If you're familiar with the Celtic cross, for example, you'll see that there is one half of the spread over here and one half of the spread over here. Um, there will be cards that are crossed. There will be cards that will be around or above and next to each other. So the shape of a spread can really tell a story. Some shapes are very basic. Um, some might be just in a circle or in a line or in a diamond, but Kim's spreads in particular, I do find very creative. So let's look at the spread positions and names, and then I'll explain how I see the shape of the spread being conveyed through these spread positions. And then I'll go back and see how the shape of the spread tells the story of this spread and reading. So first we have stretch sesh. What do I need to master in order to establish a solid foundation for channeling my power? Stretch sesh. Next is fighting stance. What do I need to do to get in the panda zone for some serious butt kicking? Fighting stance. Third card is Haya, no mercy. This is how I'm going to rock and roll. How do I unleash maximum panda power to conquer any challenge that comes my way? Haya. The fourth card is The monster rears its head. How is my fear trash talking me right now, taking to discourage me and strip me of my power? The monster rears its head. Fifth, hope is frail. Shadow clouds hover above. What does my fear show me? What's the outcome I'm trying to avoid? Hope is frail. Six, the hero rises. Yes, I'm afraid, but I'm also courageous. What is my strength, my courage, my resolve that defines me as a hero of my own story and the warrior that I am? The hero rises. And seven, the ultimate move. It is time to show fear my true powers and finish it off with style. What is my big move? What makes me a champion? The ultimate move. So with these spread positions, I do find them a little bit flowery and a little bit wordy. So while they are cool for me to read and get in the zone for, 
for actually doing a reading with, I can get a little bit tripped up in the words. So what does help me is to actually write notes, um, basic notes on what each position is. So stretch stash, fighting stance, haya, all those positions. I've written them down here. Um, just one keyword for each stretch, fighting, haya, monster. And I've basically kind of rewritten the positions in my own words. And this helps me conceptualize the spread because as I'm taking notes and rewriting it in my own words, it's kind of like taking notes in school, right? You're just rewriting the text in your own words. So rewriting these spread positions in my own words does help me understand the point of the spread better. So I appreciate Kim's flowery wording and the creative spread and the creative wording for each. It's just that for me, trying to do the reading for myself in a practical way, I just need some quick bullet points to help me uh, get through the reading. And this goes back to what I said at the beginning of how notes on paper visually just helps me understand the spread better and make connections better. I will say that if you need to rewrite or reconceptualize any of these spread positions to make sense for you, if that's what you need to do, so be it. For example, for fighting stance, I just wrote basically do this to get in the zone. So quick bullet points, if you need to rewrite or reconceptualize things to make it make sense for you, like that's what you need to do, right? So now that we've looked at the spread positions, back to the shape of the spread. We can see that the first two here, stretch, sesh, and fighting stance, these are like two prep work cards. They're next to each other because they're kind of tied together. Then we have the action card, haya. Then the haya is blocked by the monster rears his head and hope is frail. So these are like two blockage cards. Imagine this being like the prep work, getting stuff done, but then we're blocked by this. And then after you kind of fall down here, this one is the hero rises. And after the hero rises, we have this climbing up war shape of the spread. So after the hero rises, then we have the ultimate move as the last card. And the ultimate move is, you know, supposed to be a little bit higher than the rest of the cards here. So that's an example of how the shape of the spread tells the story of the spread and of the reading. Okay, so now finally flipping over some cards, let's take a look at what's going on here. I have done this reading off camera already. So I've already taken notes on what these cards are. I'm just here re-walking it through on camera and hopefully it helps someone out. Now, something that Lisa Pepez mentioned in her video was here you can do like an overview of the spread to see if there are any particular suits or numbers. I don't find that always necessary, especially if I am not trying to make like a super deep, long reading. I think that for big spreads like this, it can be overwhelming if I try to go through all of the nitty gritty, like the specific suits and specific numbers. I think that if there are an overwhelming majority of a suit or a number that jump out to me, then I would take note of that. But I guess for this reading, that didn't really stand out to me. And I would suggest that for, you know, if you're new to big spreads, you don't have to get super tripped up in the numbers or the suits. It can add to it. Just don't let it hold you back from getting in the flow of the reading and building that flow is what I'm saying. So now we have the cards, we have the spread positions. Now I would just suggest writing down the spread positions and exactly what um, card came up for each one. So I will reference my quick notes here on each spread position. Stretch sesh, what am I mastering for a solid foundation? Page of cups. Fighting stance, how am I gonna get in the zone? The hanged panda. Hiya, how to unleash maximum power? The three of wands. The monster rears its head. What's the fear that's trash talking me and discouraging me? King of pentacles. Hope is frail. My fear is showing this outcome that I'm avoiding. The hero rises, what is my strength, courage, or resolve? And the ultimate move, what is the big move, my champion move? How do I finish it off? Now, my next tip for going through big spreads is after I've written down the position, the spread name, and the card that shows up in that position, my next tip is to write down a phrase. It could be a keyword, it could be a phrase, just a short blip for each card. I think it can be very tempting or easy to start trying to decipher and go really deep into like card number one, be like the page of cups. Okay. What are all of the 10 meanings that I could think of for the page of cups? Don't do that because that might feel really exciting for the first like two or three cards. But then by the time you're at like card number six or seven, you're all like burnt out. You're like, Oh my God, I still have 10 more meanings to write for this. So don't try to do like 10 different meanings, 10 deep meanings for each card, at least not on first overview, right? For the first overview, just go through each card one by one position one by one and just write down the first one, maybe two, but just one like idea that comes to mind. This will help also build your intuition and you always have the chance to go back and redo some of um, these card interpretations if that doesn't really work out for you, right? So let me go through my notes and share what the little blip I've written for each one. So the first position, stretch. What do I need to master in order to establish a solid foundation for channeling my power? 
what is that foundation that I need here? Imagine in the Kung Fu spread, right? You're like stretching. You need to stretch before you can do like really action athletic e moves. So what do I need to stretch and put as a foundation? Page of Cups. The little blip I wrote here was open-eyed imagination. Because a Page of Cups reminds me of someone who just needs to keep their eyes open. And the context of me wanting to be shameless, I just, I want to be able to see the good in things and in people. And I want to just have that bright eyed, like nothing can go wrong kind of energy here. So open eyed imagination is what I wrote here for the page of cups. Next is fighting stance. How do I need to get in the zone? And again, considering the context of the spread, the fighting stance is how you get ready. You know, how do I prep to get in the zone? The hanged panda. The blip I wrote was acknowledge my circumstances. So from the hanged panda, I see someone who is, you know, surrendering, enlightenment, those could be key words, but the biggest thing that I see is just acknowledging my circumstances. I acknowledge that there are some things in my life that I may not really like, and there are things that I may enjoy. And I think just being open and acknowledging that that is a situation and not judging it, not, you know, trying to criticize myself for it or wish it was this way or that way, just acknowledging this is the reality neutrally is a good way for me to help get in the zone. Three, hiya, what is the action move? How do I unleash maximum panda power? The three of wands. Um, the little blip that I wrote here is exert energy outward, reach out. And this is because I see this as a reach out card because in the original context of this card, I see it as like you're pushing your ships out to sea and you're like waiting for your ships to do their own thing and then come back eventually. So I see this as a nudge to just set things in motion, just get things started. Because if I don't get things started, I can't wait for things to finish. <laughs> I, you know, that sounds weird, but I hope you know what I'm saying. Like if I don't get projects starting, um, they can't be simmering on the back burner. I need to just get them started first and get that initial start, get that inertia like out of the way. And I also mentioned reach out because this is probably a good time for me to start making plans with people. I feel like there are some times when I'm feeling a little bit like low output and I'm feeling a little bit more hermit-y, but this one with the wands card and energy card, it's a nudge for me personally to start reaching my energy outward, just pushing my energy out, like starting new things, um, getting plans in motion, you know, getting social activities on the calendar, things like that. The fourth card, monster. The monster rises its head. How is my fear trash talking me? The king of pentacles. So what I wrote here, this blip is my worry or fear of not being efficient, in quotes. And as someone who is very used to being a little bit hyper productive and an overachiever, being efficient is like my pride and joy. And sometimes I can take it very hard if I'm not feeling efficient enough. And that's always like a fear of mine, a fear that I'm not being efficient enough because I'm not stacking enough plans into the same day or I'm not, you know, making enough events for people to enjoy, that can just be a big fear. And honestly, that fear kind of stops me from acting sometimes. It kind of gets in the way of me trying to get my three of wands energy out the door. And I got efficiency because the King of Pentacles can be a character who really likes to maximize their profits, maximize their resources, maximize things. You know, I see Pentacles as like investments, like someone who tries to maximize like which stocks and bonds they invest in, you know? So that's where I got the keyword of efficiency here. And that definitely is a fear of mine sometimes. The next card down here, hope is frail. Now again, see we have a blockage here. So a blockage is my fear of being inefficient. And another blockage is what is my fear showing me? What's an outcome that I'm trying to avoid? The eight of pentacles. And a blip that I wrote here is all work, no play slash no fun. I associate the Eight of Pentacles with putting in hard work, which I think can be a valuable thing at times. Um, Lord knows I am definitely like big on work a lot of the time. However, an outcome that I'm trying to avoid this time in this self-confidence funk I'm trying to get out of, like I want to be able to enjoy life. I'm afraid of things feeling like work and dull and not fulfilling. So something that can happen is sometimes I might be so excited to get projects in motion and I have all the parts going, I have, you know, the project has been started, but then when it comes to continuing it or finishing it or even just going through it, sometimes it can feel really boring and really dull and very much like a wall. It can even feel like so unfulfilling and so unexciting. And basically something that used to be fun and joyful for me has now become dull and boring and something that I dread. So that is definitely an outcome that I'm trying to avoid 
I'm trying to avoid starting things that I know I'm going to dread later or that I fear that I'm going to dread later. So there's a fear of like inefficiency, but there's also a fear of like starting projects that are just not going to become fun later on. It's like my brain always wants something to be fun and exciting and always wants to seek the next exciting thing, which I don't know. That's another thing I got to work through. But actually that does tie in well to the next position. The hero rises. What is my strength, my courage, my resolve? It's like a card reminded me that I'm a warrior. So the nine of cups here as the hero rises, the blip that I wrote here is that I'm always pursuing a full life. So I really like that I wrote a full life here instead of just happiness because I initially was just going to write happiness um, or fulfillment. But the nine of cups, I see it as a reminder that it's not just one type of cup. It's not just like happiness is like the end goal or the state being shown here in this nine of cups. There are nine cups. That's nine varieties of emotions and things that we could be feeling and going through. And life is all about experiencing the full spectrum of things, you know? I think, again, when I get in my fear of, oh no, I fear that I'm going to be bored sometimes, like, okay, first of all, boredom is just a normal emotion of life. It does not have to be something that I have to avoid forever. <laughs> I can't avoid boredom forever. I can't prevent boredom forever either. So the Nine of Cups as the hero rising, it seems like a reminder for me that the strength in living, the strength in my life is that there is a variety of things that I experience. I cannot experience things go, go, going all the time. Um, I am trying to motivate myself to get going now, but I also can't prevent boredom and I can't be afraid of the impending boredom. I know it's going to be here eventually, but also sadness is going to be here eventually. Anger and frustration and happiness are all going to be here eventually. So I should just be trying to avoid like only one emotion because that's just a part of life, you know? <laughs> the Nine of Cups, the variety of emotions is what adds the spice to life. So with that re-motivation here, the last card is the ultimate move. What is my big move? What makes me a champion? And the Five of Swords as my ultimate move is an awesome card. The blip I wrote here is I have to actively counter the negative self-critic. I got this. And I got that from, you know, this card, these two pandas. One of them is clearly looking very defeated and the other one is looking very aggressive and very assertive and very dominant, honestly. And it reminds me a lot of a recent thing that my life coach told me in our last session. I told her that sometimes when I'm feeling good, my brain will try to flip it on me and tell me, no, you shouldn't feel good. And my life coach said something that was so simple and yet so profound. She said, so flip it back. That's literally it. That's all she said. <laughs> when my mind automatically tries to go to the negative side of things, I have to consciously put an effort to flip it back and tell that negative self-critic no, you're wrong. Like I do deserve to feel good. I'm going to feel good because I'm good. I know I got this. So this is like a reminder for me that I have to actively counter that negative self-talk. I can't just allow the negative self-talk to take the upper hand all the time because it's negative self-talk and it's stopping me from reaching my goals. <laughs> so again, here's the notes of what I wrote. And you can see that even though I didn't go super deep in depth with each card or any of the cards, I still got a pretty good reading from this. Now, now that I've gotten one like pass of this reading or this spread, if you want, you could go hone in onto any card in particular that really stands out to you and like try to write down more meanings and like deep dive into that. But honestly, since this is like a casual spread and a casual reading for me, I don't feel the need to do that. So I'm just going to leave the reading at that. There's no particular card that I feel like I need to deep dive into. And if I wanted to, I could write down more of a summary of what I just figured out um, down here in a little paragraph, tying it all up. Normally when I do readings, I do write the card and then I write more bullet points down here. That way I have space to expand on the reading here. But again, like I said, I'm pretty happy with this reading already. I don't feel the need to deep dive and go super duper deep in it. Another time I might feel that way, but today I just don't feel like it. I'm pretty happy with this reading already. So that is the Kung Fu Panda spread as created by Kim Tsun, demonstrated with the Way of the Panda Tarot. I hope that this walkthrough video and these big spread tips were helpful for you. So now I'm curious, do you have any big spreads that you enjoy? Do you have any questions or tips or tricks of big spreads? Either things that have been helpful or things that have not been helpful for you in reading big spreads? I would love to know. And if you have the way of the Panda Tarot, I'd love to know too, because it is my favorite deck and I hope it can be yours too. <laughs> so that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching. Bye.